Hello everyone, I'm going to talk about the stellar graveyard, that is, the remnants of stars. Stars will go through a violent phase when their core runs out, even low mass stars, when their core runs out, will shed a lot of energy during the contraction, shed its out outer layers, thus the embers shown in the simulation. Stellar graveyard has a couple of pieces. It has um, white dwarfs, the most common um, form of uh, stellar remnants because they come from the most common form of stars and higher mass stars we have neutron stars and we have black holes both of these objects will uh, uh, result from high mass stars we'll talk about that now a star's destiny is governed by its initial mass just as its full main sequence life was and it's also governed by a stellar neighborhood it's an interesting subject but we won't get into that here. Uh, if white dwarf is near another star, it can pull matter off, so on and so forth, and you get lots of interesting secondary effects. Let's review what happens um, again in a star in its later phases of life. It's a red giant. It goes through different type of transitions in its core. It's burning um, in shells, helium, um, hydrogen burning in different places. The core is accumulating. Uh, eventually, the helium burning turns into carbon. Now, what happens is when it runs out of, of stuff to burn in this core, the core collapses because there's nothing to support it, and you get this push-off. Observationally, a nebula is generally created. An example of that is M57 ring nebula. What's powering the center of the M57 nebula is a white dwarf. It's a little tiny dot, hardly noticeable on this photo. This white dwarf gives off light. It's actually quite hot, and it will be hot for a very, very long time. We'll discuss the physics of uh, these white dwarfs in a moment. But this hotness is not coming from any kind of nuclear fusion process. It's simply uh, a residual heat uh, be that came from this initial compression that heated up this, this dwarf, uh, this, rather, this object so much, the stellar core remainder. So let's now get into what is... Uh, white dwarf in terms of some of its uh, characteristics. One of its interesting characteristics is it's about the size of the Earth. If you have a white dwarf that's about one solar mass, it turns out to be about the size of the Earth. Interestingly, if the mass is higher, it turns out to be smaller radius. Uh, we'll talk about an effect called electron degeneracy, which is what keeps a, a white dwarf from collapsing further upon itself. Now, by way of comparison, to get a sense of the density of these objects, think about the sun. The sun is about uh, 300,000 Earth masses. But imagine 300,000 Earth masses squeezed into something of about the diameter of the Earth. Well, you're going to get a tremendously dense object. And for reference purposes, about one teaspoon of um, white dwarf matter is about a few thousand uh, pounds. So you can get a sense of this is an extremely dense object, and it's basically comprised of uh, the remnants of the core, which is mainly carbon and oxygen nuclei. And of course, it's electrically neutral, so there's a sea of electrons uh, floating around. In fact, that sea of electrons is what is fighting the further gravitational contractions. It's called a degeneracy. It's actually a quantum effect. And there's two uh, principles, the Pauli exclusion principle and Heisenberg uncertainty principle that account for this effect. But basically, the way to think of it is as the star contracts um, and the core and it gets so small, the quantum states uh, are constrained. The position of the electrons is, is well constrained. That must mean that the momentum of the electron due to the Heisenberg principle is high. When it, that momentum is high enough so that some edges of it reaches the speed of light, it's, it's, you can't go faster than the speed of light, that becomes the limit. That limit is about 1.4 solar masses. Above that, electron degeneracy crashes. You can no longer hold a star in, um, in that mode, and it collapses to uh, either a neutron star or, or a black hole. And let's uh, show that over here. Um, in the upper part of this chart, is what we just went through. Uh, white dwarf um, is uh, shown on top there. Now, in the lower one, what happens with a 
higher mass star, greater than 1.4 solar masses. Well, if, if a star is in the range of about 1.4 up to 5 solar masses, I've seen in some literature about 3 solar masses, um, it's going to have a more violent explosion. It's, in fact, it's going to be called a supernova. These are one of the most violent explosions, and they happen over a very, very short period of time. What happens is the outer cores get pushed off, and what remains is a, um, a star that he's degenerated even further. The, the uh, remnants, the atomic remnants, which oxygen, carbon, other elements, have now become a sea of neutrons. The electron degeneracy uh, pressure was overcome. The pressure is great enough to actually take the nuclei and to push, smash these nuclei together so that they form neutrons and neutrinos. So what we effectively have in a neutron star, why it's called a neutron star, is a core comprised of these um, sea of neutrinos floating around. A uh, black hole is a more massive object, um, and that's totally oblivion. We're going to talk about black holes as a separate video. So I'm going to focus now mainly on neutron stars. Uh, once again, I just show you the simulation. Hopefully you're still awake. Talk about the Crab Nebula. The Crab Nebula is a famous object. Um, it's actually powered by a neutron star. There's a neutron star. Here's the simulation. Uh, it started with an artist rendition, but what we're actually seeing here is a photograph from the Chandra X-ray satellite. This blue stuff is actually the X-ray image, and that little dot is the neutron star. It's spinning very, very rapidly. Fast spinning rapidly objects will create magnetic fields. Those strong magnetic fields are strong enough to accelerate particles and those particles smash into other gas. You get a shock wave and that is what's creating that white ring around it. You can also notice a jet. I'll talk about that in a moment. So a neutron star occurs when the mass is greater than 1.4 solar masses. And again, it results because the, uh, the gravitational pressure from something greater than 1.4 solar masses is enough to squish it down so that the actual nuclei uh, can no longer maintain their independency. And you get, uh, they kind of smash together, they get past the electron degeneracy. And what happens is, they form a sea of neutrons. A bunch of neutrinos is also released during this period. And this can hold up, it can't collapse further, you get a neutron star. So uh, again, this is a perfect example of quantum mechanics. It's the power of, uh, it's amazing when you think about how uh, these objects are explained by the basic quantum phenomena Maybe it's the most uh, dramatic demonstration of the validity of quantum mechanics. This is on a, a very large astronomical level. So a neutron star itself has another property. Uh, first of all, its density is extremely high. But like any object, uh, stars you know, generally have a spin. But now think about all this spin being compressed in a small object. It's got to conserve angular momentum. So that means what remains has to spin faster and faster and faster. Turns out that this neutron star is rotating maybe about the 30 times a second. A lot of times, uh, neutron stars form what are called pulsars. We can actually measure a very periodic pulse coming from an object. These were a mystery for a while, but it turns out that these are neutron stars. And we'll talk about, I'll show you how the uh, physics of these pulsars work in a slide or two. But let's go back to an examination of the... Um, Crab Nebula, which is a, a great example. And again, uh, suggest you look up.